Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of James. Turn to the book of James. We're going to get back into our verse-by-verse study over there. Uh, told you last... Uh, week. We're not abandoning our verse-by-verse study. We left off in the middle of chapter 4, actually towards the end of that chapter. We'll pick it up today in verse 13. Verse 13 to the end of this chapter. And let's stand together uh, at the reading of God's Word to honor Him. If you're able, if not, you can remain seated. Beginning at verse 13 in James chapter 4, the scripture says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. For we, for ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Father, may the pages uh, of Scripture come alive within our hearts and minds today as you stir our spirit through the Holy Spirit who indwells us, Father, may we glean actively that which is needed for our life. Many times we approach your word uh, without understanding there is a need to be instructed from the word of God. So, Father, we ask um, that you would stir our minds and our hearts today, that we might give appropriate attention, that we might be good listeners, good hearers of your word. And we'll give you praise and thanks for all you'll do here this morning For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. So I've taken a little four-word phrase out of verse 14 and used it for the title of the message today. What is your life? Right in the middle of that verse. What is your life? Tell you what, I spent some time just looking at those four words and thinking about that thought. When God asks us a question... And he does here uh, because his word is is appropriate to the audience today as it was in the time that it was written. Uh, As James wrote to the dispersed Jews, uh, here in this particular section, he brings an example forward of merchants uh, among the dispersed Jews who were itinerant business people who went out to trade and to buy and sell goods and... Uh, and made their plans uh, of how to be successful. They were, many of them were very successful, very accomplished in what they were doing. Uh, James seems to be bringing this message specifically at that time to that audience, but is just as applicable to others other than the original targeted audience. Uh, And remember here that James is talking to brothers and sisters in the Lord. We understand that. We've talked about it many times, but he uses the word brethren several times uh, in in this letter that he wrote to the dispersed Jews. So he's talking to the brothers and sisters in the Lord. And there's trouble in the camp. Uh, We can't think because we've been saved by the grace of God and we collectively meet, uh, whether it's formally in worship like this or at other times, whether it be socially or whatever, we can't think that because we're born again believers and we, uh, and we get together with like-minded believers that all is well. Uh, our life is a complicated series of events, thoughts, and actions and deeds. And many times we, we just go about our business uh, without thinking about Who's in it? The scripture says in in this uh, 14th verse, what is your life? We should give some thought to that. 
Because at best, a believer, and he's talking to believers, at best, were a channel of blessing. Were, were, that, were that light that God is using in the world today. We should be that beacon of light that's unfiltered and unshaded in every way. And so, but at best, as he speaks to these business people, particularly, their, their life is going to come and go. And we're going to talk about the fragile and brief nature of life itself in the midst of all that we do. We live like we're going to live forever on earth. We sort of live that way. We think that way. We're only here for a short time. In the span of eternity, the 70 plus or minus years that we live um, are just a speck of sand on a beach. Very brief. And what does God want out of our life? He wants more than just us going about our normal routine and activity to get our things done. And perhaps uh, a good answer to the question, what is your life? It should be a life that is surrendered to God to do His will and not our own. And that's what the, the crux of the issue is here. And so let's get to the first point, which I've placed in the bulletin for your benefit. <clears throat> and that is, here are the issues that we have. Number one, we're presumptuous. We're presumptuous. Uh, a dictionary definition of that word uh, is that we do something that we have no right or authority to do. We do something that we have no right or authority to do. Uh, we take for granted the power to do something. We just take it for granted. We overstep our bounds. We take liberties. And we're overconfident in ourselves. The scripture says in verse 13, <clears throat> go to now, the go to now would be better translated today, come now. <clears throat> and it's a phrase that is only used twice in the, in the New Testament. Once here, the other time, you got to look down the page just a little bit, chapter 5 and verse 1. The only two times it's used. Uh, when, you, when you take and when you look at not just the meaning of the words that are used in Scripture, but the context in which they're used, we understand that this is primarily a rebuke uh, or a prod in order to get back on track, if you will. But it is designed to capture our attention. Come now to get our attention. And so James, uh, as God inspired and breathed these words through him, seeks to capture the attention of his audience as he wrote this letter. Because there were some problems um, with, with the people uh, that the, the Jews he had, who had put their faith in Christ Jesus and been saved by the grace of God. They had, and, and he first comes out after he gets their attention with the come now in verse 13 and says, ye that say... <clears throat> Today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. <clears throat> so who is he specifically talking to as a target audience immediately in this instance? <clears throat> Those business people. Um, and he says, you that say. What were they doing? They were making plans. They were making plans. That's what they were doing. They were making plans. The bottom line for the plans was the last two words of verse 13 for profit. To get gain is simply profit. They were making plans to get a profit. And when you take a look uh, in chapter 5 and verse 1, which is not a part of our text today. We'll get to that next time, Lord willing, where he says, go to or come now, ye rich men. Those people who want to be rich. So he's addressing an issue here where... People have deviated from God's design for their life. What is your life? Your life is a series of submissions to God. But they had gotten off track to some extent. The we will, you know, the original sin uh, that Lucifer committed 
was that I will, recorded over in Isaiah uh, chapter 14, I think it was, I will, I will, I will, five times, I will. What about God's will? I will, will is a word that means desire. My desire is, I'm going to do this. And that's what they were doing here in verse 13. These merchants, we will go. We will go. And he directly addresses them. There was no submission by these people to the authority or the direction of God. They were making their own plans without submitting them to the Lord for approval. We can't just go about our life without seeking God's guidance and direction. So the we will here is a statement of presumption. Presumption that here's what we're going to do. When, when are they say they're going to do it? Uh, we're going to do it uh, tomorrow or maybe today even. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to go into such a city. So this was common. In other words, it applied to people that were just in, in mercantile bit, mer, in, in, uh, merchandising and they were going to go here, they were going to go there, they were going to go this place and that place, picking out strategically those areas that would give them the best advantage to make a profit for their business. And it's not even so much that they were trying to get filthy rich. Every business person uh, is in business to make money. That's not a sin. It's not a sin to make money. So when we go to work uh, as an employee, we go to work for a business. And I, I was I was never self-employed except for a sideline activity where I did our freelance drafting business. Uh, but when you most of my most of my work and and most of my effort was working for somebody else, and in that work, uh, my my thought process was <clears throat> it's a business i know people today and say well you know you're making too much money on that don't tell somebody whether they're making too much money or not if you think that they're charging you too much for it don't buy it go somewhere else and get it and then eventually if you want it bad enough you're going to buy it from somebody and they're making a profit <laughs> uh, and so uh it's not bad it's not sinful or wicked or evil to have a business and to make a profit in that business. In fact, a lot of people advantage off of that profit. That doesn't necessarily make it good, but it's not a bad thing to do. It's a good thing to do. The Bible never criticizes uh, worthwhile and righteous activity, industrious activity uh, that is profitable. Uh, what, what the Bible is critical of is those who desire to be rich, those who's, who are driven by the wealth itself. Uh, but I've always told people, I said, you know, it's a business and they're in business to make money. Sometimes we just want people to give us stuff. And then when they give us stuff, we want to walk away with, yeah, I got it. But if it was our business, we'd want to make some money or we wouldn't be in business very long. It's a good thing that there are businesses that are making a profit so that they can pay employees and over and beyond that, they can improve the business, take care of the the infrastructure of the business, take care of the technological aspects of the business, and take care of all the expenses that need to take place, and then share some of that wealth with employees. Typical corporations do that. You buy stock, and so you get a, a dividend or you get some kind of rewards back. Business activity is not bad in and of itself. It's, what's, it's a matter of what's in the heart when you do it. But these biz, the problem with these businessmen is not that they were going out and making a profit, the problem is they were going about it all the wrong way because they were saying, here's what we're going to do. And the ye that say obviously points to the fact that this was typical and routine activity for the people that are targeted here. And it applies to us as well as to those businessmen, uh, you know, back in the first century. It applies to us as well. And so what we find here is there... They're, they're going today or tomorrow. We're going to go into such a city and we'll continue there a year, buy and sell. And they're going to say, we're going to stay there for one year. We're going to buy, we're going to sell, and we're going to make a profit. Where's God in that equation? That is just standard, typical business activity. You don't have to be a believer to do that. In fact, that sounds like an unbeliever. It sounds like an unbeliever. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go do this. We're going to do it here. 
here we're going to, and we're, when we're going to do it, and here's what we're going to do, here's what we're going to get out of it. Everybody who's in any kind of business does that. These were believers, and they were acting like unbelievers. How were they acting like unbelievers? Because they were presuming upon the authority and the power of God by which they had no right to, um, to, to, inter, to intervene there. They had no right to step over bounds and take that authority themselves. We're going to do this. Well, what about God? What about God? What about God? Let's look back at Proverbs chapter 16 and get something, a good understanding of how we are supposed to be behaving in such a manner. Now, this applied to businessmen particularly and specific in the instant case, but it applies to every single individual how we manage and handle our life. In Proverbs 16, in the first verse, the preparations of the heart, these are arrangements, if you will. <clears throat> it's how we order and conduct our business or our activity, whether it be social or business for profit or whatever it might be. The preparations of the heart uh, literally belong to man. The in means they're in, they're, they belong to us. It's up to us to make the plans and arrangements. Yeah, so the men... Back in James chapter 4, they were making the arrangements. They had, to, they had the, the, the right to do that. They were making arrangements. But it says, but, here's the problem they didn't have. The answer of the tongue is from the Lord. That means that the, the voice of approval or disapproval comes from God. <clears throat> we can say, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to go over, you know, next week we're going to go take a vacation. Doesn't just apply to work activity. I'm going to go take a vacation next week. I'm going to go take a vacation this summer. Did you ever ask the Lord whether that is permissible? Do I have to ask for permission? Yeah. Because see, when we don't ask God for permission, we're just assuming that we have the power and we have the authority to make that plan and execute it. And you know how we get so deeply ingrained in that process that it's up to us? Because we do it routinely and we do it often and we never seek the Lord and things work out okay. Unbelievers do the same thing. <clears throat> there's a, <clears throat> there's a, um, and, and as you look on here, verse two of Proverbs 16, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. That means we make plans and, and we, we fine tune them and get them the way we want it and we approve of that. But does God approve of that? Because the answer of the tongue in verse 1 is the approval or disapproval from God. <clears throat> and quickly in verse 2, everything we plan is looks good in our eyes. <clears throat> it says, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. That is our mind. The spirits are our attitude, our mind what we use in order to make those plans. So verse three says, commit your works unto the Lord and the thoughts, now your thoughts will be established. Commit your works to the Lord. Whatever it is you do, you got to commit it to the Lord. <clears throat> you can't just presume upon the enablement to get it done on your own. We do it all the time. We do it routinely and it seems to work out pretty good. And, we, and I think a lot of people things fail or they go wrong or they go bad and they blame the circumstances. They blame the person who's in the path that disabled my plan. We blame them. When many times the problem is we never submitted it in our own hearts and mind to the Lord to see whether or not God approved of that plan. We go on a vacation, it turns out horribly. <clears throat> what happened? Well, you know, the airlines, I'm going to blame the airlines. I'm going to blame the hotel. You know, I'm going to blame the, the, the tour service. You know, the bus ride was just horrible. You know, the rental car was bad. It's the rental car's fault. No, it may well be our fault. Maybe we didn't submit it to the Lord. <clears throat> In verse 4 here, it says, The Lord hath made all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil, and if you go down to verse 9, <clears throat> a man's heart deviseth his way. That means we prepare, we make arrangements, we order our life. But the Lord directs our steps. So how do we connect those two? 
We connect them back in verse 3. Commit your works to the Lord. Everything we do, your works, it's not work activity per se. It's everything we do. Commit everything we do to the Lord. How do we commit it to the Lord? We submit it to the Lord for His approval. We don't have the right to approve the things that get done in our life. God, because it says in verse 1 that the preparations of the heart belong to man, but the, the, the answer of approval or disapproval comes from God. We have to get approval. We have to get approval. Uh, if you look down to um, uh, verse... Uh, um, 19, Proverbs 16, verse 19. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. So we have to have our trust and our confidence in the Lord. And we can only do that if we are submitted to the Lord in everything that we do. We're too presumptuous. We just go about our activities and we don't even think about them. There are routine decisions and activities that we do every day. And we don't bother to think about whether or not God approves of that. So if we don't bother going to the Lord and praying about that and say, how do you do that? First Thessalonians chapter five says, pray without ceasing. <clears throat> that means we're always thoughtful that we don't have the right or the authority or the privilege to do it without God. Uh, we understand that it's a lot more complicated to that than that, if you will. And the dispersed, the dispersed belie- uh, believers that were Jewish here, they, as we go back to James, uh, they were successful in what they're doing. Some of them were very successful. <clears throat> buying and selling and getting gain. The issue is they they habitually live their life without regard for God's will and God's authority. They routinely did that. That's the issue. And now the second point we find at the the end of verse uh, 14, because the first part of verse Verse 14 says, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, the next day. You don't know what's going to be. You make plans for tomorrow. We're going to do this. You don't know. I tell people oftentimes, I say, well, I'll, I'll see you on Thursday to go bowling, uh, Lord willing. And they say, yeah, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. I said, you know what? And I'm, I'm tired of that phrase. I said, it doesn't matter if the creek rises or not. If the Lord's willing, I'll be there. If the Lord's willing, I'll be there. But we, we equate the creek rising, you know, and, you know, God can speak through a creek. I understand that. We go against God's will. God can stop us in our tracks, right? But that's God's will. We need to be submissive, submissive to God's will. At the end of verse 14, we are powerless. We're not only presumptuous, that is, we presume to have the right or authority that we don't have. God alone has that authority. But we're powerless. <clears throat> The end of verse 14 says, for what is your life? It is, God tells us what it is. Our life is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. One of the best examples of this vapor that I know of is you're outside on a really cold day. And when you breathe, you see that vapor come out because you got a warm body and the the moisture from the body goes out. And you see that vapor and it's gone. God compares our life. In fact, he says, what is your life? He asks us that question. Then he says, it is a vapor that appears for a little while and then it's gone. It appears for just a little while. Uh, and um, in, uh, I'm not going to turn there, but Job 7.7, 7, uh, Job said that our life is just a wind, a breath. That's all it is. It's just a breath. In Psalm 102 and verse 3, our life is called just smoke. You got a fire burning and the smoke goes up and you see it yay far. And even some of the biggest and darkest smoke clouds that you see coming off a fire, they eventually disappear. They're gone. It doesn't take long. And Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 24 calls our life 
of the grass. When the flower comes and then the flower, flower fades and the grass is gone. I got areas in my yard that I plant grass seed every year. <clears throat> the next year, come spring, there's nothing there. <laughs> there's nothing there. Nothing. It's like grass. That's, we think that we're strong and mighty and we're going we're gonna to do this. We make plans for next year, 10 years from now. And, and, and we're just confident that all we got to do is execute on the plan. Well, what about God? God has the authority and the say about this. We don't have it. I want to remind us of a couple of things. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I can do all things. <clears throat> well, John uh, wrote over in 1 John that, the, that every, everything that we desire must be submitted to the will of God. It must be submitted to the will of God. Even Jesus, we got that great example when he was under duress uh, <clears throat> and agonizing over uh, the death at the cross. And he said, let this cup, the cup of death, pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. I can't imagine anything that's more, ex uh, more an ag agonizing than knowing you're going to die and how you're going to die in such an excruciating and horrible manner. You know the date and the time because he was God himself. And he said, because he was holy God, he was yet holy man. And <clears throat> he said, let this thing pass from me. But your will, God, my father, I'm going to go through it. What did Abraham do when God told him to take his son up on the, the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice? You don't see any hesitation at all in the scripture. He just gathers the stuff and he's ready to go. He's ready to go. It's God's will, not our own. And we would look at some of those examples and say, no way I'm going through that. If we were facing a, a, a death like that, and we, would, we would be finding all different kinds of way to get out of that. When an illness comes to us, we go find a doctor, we go find medicine, and we want to get well, and we want everybody to pray for us, and we want to be well right now. But why are we sick to start with? Could be because we are disobedient to God. We understand that from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We read that passage of Scripture when we take the Lord's Supper. And it says, the reason many people are sick among you in the church and it was addressed to the church at Corinth, but applies today. The reason many of you are sick is because you take the Lord's Supper unworthily. But they want to blame the weather. They want to blame allergies. They want to blame, you know, somebody, you know, created the situation and they got a headache. Or maybe they got injured to some extent. There are, and I'm not saying every case, but God many times allows sickness to come into our life because we've been disobedient. And we don't, the last thing we'd ever think about is, Lord, maybe, maybe this is because I've sinned. Maybe it's because I've sinned. The bottom line, and, and no surprise, we read it at the very beginning, the bottom line to hear at the end of verse 17, it is sin. It is sin. Sin is the problem. And just because we're saved by the grace of God doesn't make us immune from the chastisement and the discipline of God. There are always consequences for sin. Always. When things happen to us, we look at the obvious things that are around us that seem to be causal in nature. When in fact we need to be looking inside to see whether or not it's something spiritual by way of lack of obedience or attention to do things God's way in a way that is... So we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. But John chapter 15 and verse 5, uh, John quoted the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus said to his disciples, without me, you can do nothing. Oh, we love Philippians 4.13. I don't hear anybody, I don't hear anybody quoting John 15.5. I don't hear anybody quoting it. You ever heard anybody quote it? Just, no. Why? Because we just, our natural thought process is positive and we can do anything. But you know what? The other side of the coin is without Christ, we can do nothing. So if we can do nothing, 
That leads back to the point of presuming that we can do things. We presume that we can do them. So we're self-willed and determining that we want to get our desires filled. We never submitted it to the Lord. But yet we are powerless. We, we, we have to rely upon the strength and the power of God. Uh, we're enabled by the Holy Spirit to do God's will. But we have to be submitted to God in order to do it. And our life is just frail. We are powerless. We're just a simple vapor out there. We're just a simple vapor. We come and we go. The next point is found in verse 16. <laughs> Many of us don't like to hear this. We're proud. Just because we're saved by the grace of God and we submit it uh, to God's plan of salvation, faith in Christ, genuinely put trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we got saved by God's amazing grace, doesn't make us exempt from ever falling into pride again. We are proud people. We're proud. Just think about the last time you bragged about something. Probably, maybe as you came in the doors of the church, maybe it was early this morning, maybe it was yesterday, we oftentimes brag about things to let others know how good we are, how good things are going for us, and we never allow the Lord to get the glory out of that thing. I know of a... Uh, I seem like a broken record many times. People come out and say, well, good message. Well, thank the Lord for it. It's not my message. I don't want it to be my message. I want it to be the Lord's message. Lord, it uh, doesn't mean I'm perfect. doesn't mean that I haven't inserted my will into the equation at times. But my effort and my, and my desire is not to do that. But we have to make a conscious effort to do it. And even at that, we still fail. What does it say there in verse 16? It says, but you now rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. <clears throat> Two things I want to point out here particularly. Uh, one is, they were bragging. But more so than the bragging, they were happy about that. We brag because it makes us feel good. That was a problem. It is a problem. We brag about things that we accomplished and we never gave glory to the Lord and we're happy the fact that we did it. In fact, many times what we share to other people about our family, about our work activity, our social activity, our recreational activity, our hobbies, whatever it might be, is about what we have accomplished. And in most of those conversations, most of those conversations, we don't give credit or glory to the Lord. And the reason I think we don't give it to the Lord is because we didn't get it right at the front end. <clears throat> we said, I'm going to go do this. Oh, what does the Lord want? Uh, I'm going to go do this. We don't want that still small voice holding us back from what we want to do. And so the whole process ends up as a huge failure. Even though these businessmen were successful, it says in verse 16, <clears throat> you rejoice in your boasting. They were boasting about making money because they were so successful. They had accomplished much in their business activities. So they were bragging about that. What did the Lord say here through James? All, the word A-L-L, -L, all such rejoicing is evil. That means it's sinful. All such rejoicing. Such. That means anything that is similar. All such. So we start bragging about things and we're happy. It makes us happy. We got to be careful that we, didn't, that we didn't get the design right to start with. That we make the preparations. But the answer of approval or disapproval comes from the Lord. And that requires submission to the Lord and His authority because we don't even have the authority to make those plans. We can let the Lord know, He says in, uh, in, he says in Philippians, that we are to uh, not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication make our requests be made known. We can make our requests known to God. We can let Him know our desires, but we need to wait for an answer from God. Many times we just want to tell God what we're going to do and ask Him to bless that. Rather than submitting it to His authority, we presumptuously assume that what we're going to do is right because it's always clean in our own eyes, according to Proverbs. 
chapter 16, our plans are always good. It's other people's plans that are sour and turn bad. Our plans are always good. <clears throat> something's wrong about it. It's not because our planning was wrong. It's not because our choices were wrong. It's because something got in our way. And really, in reality, we never received approval from God in order to do it. We're proud. All too often, we're proud. Uh, and the answer to that pride is back in verse 7 of this same chapter. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit yourselves to God. Uh, in verse 8, draw nigh, draw near to God, and He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. Who's He talking to? Believers. We still sin after we've been saved by the grace of God. And then He goes on uh, in verse uh, 10 of this chapter humble yourselves in the sight of God and he shall lift you up the problem is we try to lift ourselves up we're going to dig ourselves out of this hole we're going to get out of this muck and mire and I'm going to make something of myself the Lord will lift us up we need to humble ourselves before him submit ourselves to him draw close to him with a humble heart and then God lifts us up we can't lift ourselves up without Christ we can do nothing nothing the last point uh, regarding the issues is found in verse 17, and that is we're persistently self-willed. It's just we're persistent about it. <clears throat> verse 17, therefore to him that knoweth to do good. We'll say, well, you know, uh, what I did was a wholesome activity. Did we submit it to the Lord? Were we conscious that we, that, that, we can't just decide that things are good on our own. You say, well, what could be wrong with that? Well, God's got a different plan. And God wants something out of our life. God wants something out of our life that we can't see, that we can't envision. That's why the answer needs... So if we, if we commit, in, in Proverbs 16... Uh, verse 3, if we commit our works, if we commit our activity to the Lord, God will establish our hearts. He will establish our hearts. So if we're committed to God, so how do we know that we make good decisions? When we commit what we're going to do to the Lord. We commit it to the Lord. Not for our, not for our advantage. Not that we think we might get something out of it ourselves, but we do it because we receive approval from God through humble submission to Him, and then God will direct our steps. God will direct our steps. Too often we were presumptuous to take it on our own, and we direct our own steps. Remember, the Word of God is a light unto our path, right? It's a light unto our path. God Will, will lead us down the path of righteousness, but we have to be submissive to the light of God's Word. That means obedient to His Word. But we're persistently self-willed. Uh, we need to submit to God. We need to draw close to Him, humble ourselves before Him. But the end of verse 17 is something we can't assume we're not guilty of. And that is, it says, to him that knoweth to do good... God gives us, if we seek God's Word, if we seek to understand whether or not this is the right thing, we can make the preparations. God gives us an answer of approval or disapproval according to Proverbs 16.1. So when we know the right thing to do and we don't do it, what does it say? <clears throat> and doeth it not. Doeth it not. It's a problem. It was a problem in the church there. It's a problem in the church here. We don't do it. We know what the right thing to do is, but there's something that gets in the way. And it's that persistent self-will. We may seek approval from the Lord, and the Lord doesn't give us the answer we want. We've got to make a choice. Do we fail to do what we want to do. That thing that means so much to us. Are we going to fail? Are we going to go ahead and do it anyway? Or are we going to say, okay, Lord, I got it. I'm not going to do it. Our problem is many times we get to the point where we know what the right thing to do is and we still don't do it. 
Let's read that again. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's sin. Sin is rebellion against God. It's not submitting to God's authority as we're told in verse 7 of this chapter. Submit yourselves to God. So we're, we're strong-headed, bull-headed, strong-willed. And by, by hook or crook, we're going to do this thing. You ever use that expression or something like it? Yeah, we have. We've done that. We know what the right thing to do is. Here, knowing the right thing to do is knowing the direction and guidance of God through his approval or disapproval. And then when we go ahead and do it anyway, that's a sin. That is a sin. Let's close with this thought back from verse 15. And that's the answer. It's for, for you ought to say. Remember, we started out in verse 13. Come now, ye that say. Here's what people are saying. And we all, we're all guilty of saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other. <clears throat> ye that say, we will, in verse 13. You ought to say, in verse 15, if the Lord will. So when we say, I will, we ought to say, Lord, if you will. That's what we ought to say. And it should be routine. We should be persistent about that. It should be a matter of course in our life. Verse 15, you ought to say, this is that instruction from the Lord here. You ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So to say, Lord willing, I'm going to do that. We're submitting. It's not a phrase we use to justify what we're going to do. It's not a phrase we use just to sort of throw it out there and appease the Lord to some extent. It's got to be heartfelt. It's got to be heartfelt. Because the problem is there are some things we really want, things we desire, and we just go do it anyway. Even after we, if we did submit it to the Lord and we don't get the answer we want, we go and do it anyway. And verse uh, 17 says, that is sin. If we know to do good and don't do it, it's sin. Sin is rebellion against God. We rebel against God's will. We rebel against God's word. We're disobedient to the Lord. There are consequences for that. When's the last time we looked at our life at a period when we got sick? It doesn't mean every time we sick that we're disobeyed God and that we sin. It doesn't mean that every time we get sick. But when we get sick, it ought to be an opportunity, or whether that or some other thing happens that is somehow adverse to us, we ought to look back and check, check whether or not we submitted our will to God's will. We have to do that. What is our life? It's just a vapor. It's just a vapor. But our life should be a series of persistent Obedient, a persistent obedience to God. Submitting ourselves to God's will, not doing our own will, submitting our desires to the Lord, submitting them to the Lord, but receiving the answer and being obedient to the answer that God gives us. Because we do stuff that we want to do routinely that we never ask the Lord about. And if the Lord were in some way to try to intervene, when we finally get it done, we tell other people, you know what? I've been trying to do this for three weeks. And this happened, and that happened, and this happened, and that happened, and it's just been a horrible experience trying to get here. You ever think that maybe God was trying to stop us in our tracks? May well be. Sometimes we get so bullheaded and stubborn that we're just going to want to do it anyway. If we know to do good... The problem is many times we don't know to do good because we've never submitted it to the Lord. When we do submit it to the Lord and then we don't do God's desire, we do our own, it's a problem. It's a problem called sin. So we've got to examine our own lives in this issue to see, to check our own life. What is our life? Our life is no longer our own. That's what it is. It's no longer ours to live. It's not. We can't do with our body what we want to do. This earth is, is not our home. 
were aliens and strangers in this land and were here on a mission from God to do His will. Jesus told the Jews over and over again when He told them that He was the Messiah and that He was God Himself. He says, I came to do the will of My Father who sent Me. He said it over and over and over and over again. Those times that are recorded. And I believe there were just tons of times it was a constant mantra from the Lord Jesus Christ on earth when He said, I've not come to do My own will. I've come to do the will of My Father in Heaven. It was that example of looking to God's for approval or disapproval of whatever it is we intend to do. And failure to do that has consequences in our life because if we, it, it's called sin. And in Hebrews chapter 12, God says that He chastens every child of His. He chastens, He disciplines every child. <clears throat> and if we don't look back at the last day, week, month, and we don't find any discipline in our life, we're presuming upon God that we're just living our own life and there's some issues in life and things come up and I get it's okay. It's okay. I just keep living the way I've been living. I haven't died yet, right? Not the way to approach it. We can't be presumptuous and make our own plans. They have to be submitted to the Lord and to the Lord's will. Submit them to the Lord's will. Everything we do. Everything that we do. Let's stand together. Father, we're thankful for this passage of Scripture that You've given to us today that we might focus our attention and hone our, our, our life that's just a vapor uh, so that it might be uh, pleasing in Your sight. <clears throat> Father, we can't seek our own approval. We can't seek the approval of others. We must seek Your approval. Yes, Lord, You want us to make plans. You want us to go about our activity and our business. You want us to make decisions. You want us to go and to do. But Father, as we do that, without Christ we can do nothing. And we know that every preparation of the heart needs to be submitted to Your will. And then we must be obedient to that answer that comes, whether it's approval or disapproval. Sometimes there are things that we don't want to do, and yet you encourage us to do those. That's the sin of omission. And so we have the sin of commission and omission, and oftentimes we fail and fall short of your glory in each of these areas. Father, we pray, and we can't live a sinless life, and we know that. <clears throat> what you expect from us is to be mature and to be complete in Christ. And so, Father, as we, as we continue to walk in this world under your direction and guidance and in accordance with your will and submission to your authority, uh, <clears throat> we know, Father, that whether or not it, we consider it to be good, it'll be good. Because we know that all things work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So may we be willing to go for wherever and to do whatever that will be fulfilling for your purpose and pleasing in your sight. May we place our interest and desires secondary in every situation. And Father, we, we, want to, uh, we want to just ask that you would continue to remind us of these truths as we continue to search these pages of Scripture and to understand how you want us to live this life. Too often we live our lives without even searching the Scriptures. And so that we don't even know what's good. But then when we do know, and we don't do it, either way, it's still sin. So Father, we come confessing that sin today, whatever those issues might be in our own individual lives. And we ask, Father, that as you give us the grace to live this life pleasing to you, that we would take full advantage of that. We'll give you praise and thanks for all that you've done here this morning and for that which you will continue to do in our lives in the days, weeks, and months ahead. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.